Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky for October 2020. And although we're saying goodbye to the Milky Way core, there's still plenty of Milky Way action to be had this month. Mars also makes its closest approach to Earth until 2033. We have two full moons this month. We also have the Orionids meteor shower and a couple of other meteor showers as well. And the winter constellations are now starting to rise earlier and earlier. But before we deep dive into all of that and more, a quick message from the sponsors of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. There are thousands of inspiring classes covering a huge range of creative topics such as graphic design, photography, videography, freelancing and more. I'm sure many of you watching this video will appreciate Ian Norman's class on nightscapes, an incredible introduction to all things landscape astrophotography, or how about James Manning's Astronomy for Starscapes which will help you make sense of the night sky and plan your astrophotographs with ease. I've been using Skillshare for just over a year now and I've used it for all sorts Sorts of stuff. There are lots of good classes on freelancing and running a business and also Adobe Premiere classes that help me edit these videos. Premium members get access to all of those courses and you can try as many as you like and if you want to join along just follow the link in the video description and you get two months completely free of Skillshare Premium. So starting in the northern hemisphere and you'll see that in the evening Ursa Major is sweeping across the northern horizon. It's nice and low and this is my favorite position of Versa Major, it is upright position, nice and low to the horizon, so you can get some nice foreground interest in there as well. But if we turn to the south, we'll see the Milky Way core setting in the southwest in the evening, late evening. But not to worry because there's still plenty of Milky Way action to have because as the core sets, we're left with the Great Rift, which stretches along the constellation Aquila. And this is a very interesting region of the Milky Way, a dark dust lane that blocks our view of the Milky Way. And even as the night continues to go on, the Cygnus region, one of my favorite parts of the Milky Way, comes down low to the west and even comes right down to touch the horizon in the northwest in the early hours of the morning so there's still plenty of Milky Way action to be had and you'll see Jupiter and Saturn so both of them in Sagittarius Jupiter starts the month at minus 2.4 and ends the month at minus 2.2 magnitude Saturn shines at a modest 0.5 and gets a little bit dimmer to 0.6 by the end of the month uh, but if we take a look at Mars so Mars makes its closest approach to Earth on the 6th and it will be the closest Mars will be to Earth until 2033. So its disk size will be nice and big. And then on the 13th is when Mars reaches opposition so it will be shining at its brightest. And it will be shining at minus 2.6 making it brighter than Jupiter in the current night sky. You'll also notice Andromeda, the spiral galaxy, is now climbing high into the east and even gets higher into the southeast as the night goes on. Of course got the winter constellations, the winter circle starting to make its way above the horizon a bit earlier now so by 2am you've got the full winter circle there, all of those bright stars and there's some real nice jewels of the night sky in this area. And as we reach the pre-dawn hours you'll see Venus still shining at a very bright minus four but as the month goes by, Venus will get closer and closer to the sun. So it'll be spending less and less time in the morning skies as the month goes by. As for the southern hemisphere, you can see the Crux constellation now coming down to the southern horizon. And depending on your latitude, the Crux may be below the horizon. But you can see the large and small Magellanic clouds nice and high spending most of the night at pretty high altitudes above the horizon. You can also see the Carina Nebula there rising higher in the early morning hours. But as for the Milky Way, so as darkness falls the Milky Way can be found in the west. There's a really nice opportunity here for a Milky Way arch, the Milky Way nice and low on the horizon and you'll even see Andromeda in the north-northeast 
So it was a really good opportunity for a really nice wide panorama there. But those in the Southern Hemisphere get a little bit more time with the core than those of us in the Northern Hemisphere. So quite a few hours there. So you can still enjoy the Milky Way core before the Milky Way almost gets parallel to the horizon. So it's another quite an interesting photographic opportunity there. But then, of course, the Milky Way core sets along with Jupiter and Saturn. As I already mentioned, Jupiter shining at minus 2.4 at the start of the month, and it dims a little bit to minus 2.2, and then Saturn shining at a modest 0.5 to 0.6. And then if we turn towards the east, you can already see the winter constellations there, Orion, Sirius, Gemini, Auriga, Taurus, and a different section of the Milky Way now arching across the eastern skies. So another opportunity for a, a nice big Milky Way panorama, a Milky Way arch. And as the night goes on, the winter constellations head into the north. And then of course the sun starts to rise. Mars you can see crossing over the northern horizon. Mars making its closest approach to Earth until 2033 on the 6th and then on the 13th it reaches opposition so it'll be shining at its brightest for the year and it'll be shining at a magnitude of minus 2.6 so it'll be brighter than Jupiter in the current night sky. And in the morning skies you'll see Venus rising in the east shining at a nice bright minus 4 but as the month goes by It'll be getting closer and closer to the sun, so it'll be spending less and less time in the morning skies. Now this month we have two full moons. So the first is actually on the first of the month, and it's the harvest moon, a correction from last month's video where I mentioned that last month's moon was the harvest moon, but this is actually the harvest moon because it's the closest moon to the September equinox. And the second full moon falls right at the end of the month on the 31st, which is Halloween. So we have a full moon on Halloween, and as it's the second full moon in a month, it's known as a blue moon. And in Native American culture, it is the Hunter's Moon. So we have a Halloween blue Hunter's Moon. I'm sure the media are going to have a whale of a time with these headlines. Uh, but just remember that the blue is nothing to do with the moon actually turning blue. It's just because it's the second moon in a month. Now, coming up this month, we have a reliable meteor shower in the Orionids. And because the radiant point is in the constellation Orion, it's viewable pretty much all over the world. But remember, you don't need to look towards the radiant to be able to see meteors. They'll be falling all over the sky. Rates do get better in the pre-dawn hours as Orion gets higher in the sky. So as the radiant gets higher and higher, uh, the rates do tend to pick up. So it's another meteor shower that's better in the pre-dawn hours. The peak is expected on the 21st. And you should see about 10 to 20 meteors per hour from a dark sky place. And luckily this year, a crescent moon will be setting in the early evening, leaving the pre-dawn hours nice and dark and free of light pollution from the moon. But it's also worth noting that even though the peak is on the 20th to the 21st, the Orion is, doesn't really have a sharp peak. It's quite a broad peak, so it's definitely worth going out a few nights before the peak and, and a few nights after the peak, where rates still should be pretty decent. One thing to note is that Orion meteors are very fast, so they streak across the sky very quickly, but they make up for that in the high rate of meteors that leave persistent trains. So almost 50% of Orionids leave vaporized, colorful gas trails in the sky, which you will certainly pick up in your images as well. There's also a minor meteor shower that, which peaks on the 7th in the Draconids, and because the radiant point is within the head of the dragon Draco, it's more of a northern hemisphere meteor shower. But if you're close to the equator, it's worth looking north, uh, and you should see maybe a couple, but rates never really get more than five per hour. And interestingly, it's a meteor shower that's actually better in the evening because Draco, at least the, dra the head of the dragon, is high in the sky as darkness falls, and then it sinks lower and lower and lower. So the rates are pretty good in the evening and then drop off in the morning. And fortunately, this year, a waning gibbous moon will rise in the very late evening. So there'll be a window of opportunity in the evening skies with darkness and hopefully you'll be able to see a few meters. But again, it never really gets more than about five per hour for a dark sky location. And there's some more activity with the Taurids meteor shower, which 
The stream of debris has been split into two by Jupiter's gravity, which gives us the northern Taurids and the southern Taurids meteor showers. So the southern Taurids is expected to peak around the 10th to the 11th, but again, it's a very minor meteor shower with no more than sort of five per hour. And unfortunately, the time of the peak of the moon will be hindering the morning sky. So the Taurids is one of the meteor showers that are better in the morning. But even though the Taurids is not a very active meteor shower, it does have a high rate of fireballs. So even though there's not many meteors, a high percentage of them are fireballs. And the Taurids is a very broad, stretched out meteor shower that starts in September and goes on until November. Um, so you may be lucky in seeing a few fireballs this month. And then towards the end of this month, the Northern Taurids meteor shower becomes active, but that's not expected to peak until November. So we'll look at that in next month's video. And that's pretty much all I've got for you this month, guys. So on to the hashtag Wittens. For those of you who are new here, every month I set a challenge for people to photograph, upload their images to Instagram and Twitter, tag them using the hashtag Wittens, what's in the night sky, and then I pick my three favorite for a price. So third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets, second wins a what's in the night sky t-shirt, and first wins a photo view photography guidebook of your choice. Last month the challenge was planets and I was actually quite surprised how many photos were using planets as the main subject. Normally they're like a sub-subject when people are photographing the Milky Way or something else. Um, but a lot of people really put effort into focusing on the planets and using the planet as the main subject. So it made my job in picking a winner a little bit difficult but definitely worth checking out the hashtag because there are some amazing images streaming in i think there are over 15,000 now so in third place was tim pro with this star trail image of mars trailing across the sky looking through the trees i just love the color of mars that red orange just really shining through and it really just stands out especially against that sort of blue contrasty backdrop as well i really like this something nice and different so well done to Tim, you win a copy of my Lightroom presets. In second place was this image from Shivam Bansal of Mars. I just love the detail, it's very nice and sharp. You can see the South Polar Ice Cap and some of the craters on Mars, but you can also see two of the moons as well, two of the asteroid moons, Phobos and Deimos. Uh, I'm just really blown away by the detail, the color is stunning, and it's just a really, really great image. And then in first place is this image from Astro A22, a Venus rising into the morning skies and peering into this garden and lake. And I just love the composition. It's really inviting uh, and it has a really nice layered sort of 3D uh, feel to the landscape. You can always feel yourself walking into the image uh, and taking a look around under the light of Venus. And there's just something about this image that I really, really liked. And there's another image from Astro A22 that I also considered uh, as a prize as well and this one here at Rannoch Moor um, of Mars there with Pleiades to the left and a really nice sort of lakeside scene so probably taken on the same night so a very fruitful night of astrophotography for Astro A22 there so this month um, I'm really struggling there's a lot going on but we've got two full moons and a lot of meteor showers so moon and meteors they don't have to be in the same image but I'll be looking for full moon images and images of any meteors that you do capture this month. But that's all I've got for you guys. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of What's in the Night Sky. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck in clear skies.